Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar hosted by the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California and Neuropace. Tonight, Dr. Josiah Ambrose will be discussing the surgical evaluation process at a Level 4 Epilepsy Center. But before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. If you have joined the presentation through the webinar link, you join in listen-only mode using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing in your questions into the Q&A or the chat panel at the bottom of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email with a link to view the recording. I would also like to welcome those watching via Facebook Live. You can ask questions throughout the live stream by leaving a comment on the video. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ambrose. Dr. Josiah Ambrose is an epilepsy specialist and the director of the Epilepsy Center at Kaiser Redwood City. Dr. Ambrose. All right, well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm Dr. Ambrose here uh, speaking to you from Redwood City Kaiser. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about the surgical evaluation process at a level four epilepsy center. Uh, for those of you tuning in, uh, some of you may have already been to an epilepsy center and some of you may have never heard of an epilepsy center. So hoping to clear up tonight what the experience is like of going to an epilepsy center and what the journey is like of meeting an epilepsy doctor called an epileptologist and in terms of what types of tests we might order and what kind of treatments we may be able to offer you. Um, I want to, of course, thank the Epilepsy Foundation for inviting me to give this talk, and I have no financial disclosures. So uh, our goals of this talk uh, this evening, uh, first of all, is kind of describe what is an epilepsy center, uh, who are the different uh, folks you would meet at an epilepsy center to be involved in your care as part of a team. And then, are you someone who should be seen at an epilepsy center? Uh, a lot of people don't even know that epilepsy centers exist, but we're out there. There are several of us in the Bay Area, and we have an important function in terms of helping people who have been struggling with epilepsy, either a care for their epilepsy or a proper diagnosis. And then, as I mentioned, I'm going to describe some of the testing and potential treatment options that are offered at an epilepsy center. I think for a lot of folks, it can be kind of daunting. Um, you know, what is involved? Uh, you know, are people going to be pressuring me to have surgery? How do I know if I need surgery? I think these are a lot of the questions that are in people's minds uh, when they think about going to an epilepsy center in advance. So I'm hoping to, you know, give you a good sense of what's involved how we can help, and then certainly leave time at the end of the talk uh, for your questions. But first of all, what is a level four epilepsy center? Well, it's a comprehensive team-based approach to treating epilepsy. And as we'll discuss in more detail later, most patients who have epilepsy uh, are pretty straightforward in terms of, of being treated. And, you know, most folks are gonna try their first or second seizure medication, and that's it. They're gonna be seizure free. But about a quarter of other patients that will not respond uh, to medications, sometimes even combinations of medications. So it's important for those patients to figure out what other types of treatment options are available. And coming to a level four epilepsy center is usually part of that process. Um, the team that's involved at an epilepsy center involves neurologists, uh, usually neurologists who've done additional fellowship training uh, in epilepsy care, and those doctors are sometimes referred to as epileptologists. The teams also involve neurosurgeons who have specific uh, history of doing epilepsy surgery. Um, there are neuroradiologists who look at brain scans all day long, uh, nurse practitioners, neuropsychologists who do specific testing uh, for cognitive function, memory, attention. We'll talk more about that later. Um, also psychiatrists uh, and other physicians who can help and make sure that 
someone would be appropriate and healthy for a potential epilepsy surgery, if that's what the recommendation ends up being. Um, and to get the designation as a level four center, uh, that center needs to be able to provide a complete evaluation for epilepsy surgery. And typically, and we'll go into more detail about this, this is gonna involve advanced brain imaging, uh, recording of seizures, something called neuropsychological testing, and also psychosocial support and basically total care for each patient because each patient's story is different and the way they need to be treated and what kind of options they'll have are going to be unique to that person. So who designates a level four epilepsy center? Well, there's an actual association called the NAEC, or National Association of Epilepsy Centers. Um, in the Northern California Bay Area, there are several of us, uh, Kaiser Permanente, Stanford, UCSF, California Pacific Medical Center, uh, UC Davis. Um, but level four centers are available all throughout the country. And if you're calling in today and you know, are interested in finding a level four center near you, I do recommend going to the NAEC website, naec-epilepsy.org, uh, to find out if there's an epilepsy, a level four epilepsy center near you. I think it's also important to emphasize that level four centers will offer more than just surgery. Now, surgery is certainly not for everyone. It's not something that all of my patients want, and certainly all of my patients are not candidates for epilepsy surgery. So even though it's the focus of tonight's talk, it's just one of several things that uh, we can offer at an epilepsy center. Uh, sometimes it can be very challenging to actually confirm a diagnosis of epilepsy. The usual testing is coming back normal. It's unclear what's going on. Uh, level four epilepsy centers have the testing uh, available to usually uh, confirm with total certainty if someone has epilepsy. Um, some patients don't need a surgery, but are having a lot of difficulties with their medications, whether it's side effects, um, just not being able to tolerate them in general, having difficulties with medications interacting with other medicines they're taking. And since we have a lot of experience in treating patients with these medications, and at this point there's over 24 medicines out there, uh, it is nice to speak with someone who has maybe some additional expertise and can provide some additional recommendations about what medications might be right for you. Uh, some patients are not candidates for a traditional epilepsy surgery where a piece of the brain is actually removed. And uh, in those cases, they may be candidates for other types of invasive treatment, such as neurostimulator implants. And if you had uh, seen Dr. Vikram Rao's previous talk about these implants, he talked quite a bit about the vagal nerve stimulator and the NeuroPACE device. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that tonight, um, but those are the primary stimulators that we're using uh, at present. And some patients may also benefit from having a specific diet, uh, such as the ketogenic diet or modified Atkins diet, and most level four epilepsy centers will have dietitians trained in guiding people through these challenging but effective diets. So again, this won't be the focus of my talk tonight, but I think it's important to realize that there are other reasons to consider coming to an epilepsy center for an evaluation. So you might be thinking to yourself, should I be seen in an epilepsy center? Um, and, and who should come? Well, I think a rule of thumb that the NAEC puts forward is that generally, uh, if you've been working with your primary neurologist for over a year and you're still having seizures, it might be worth considering, all right? More specifically, if you've tried two or more seizure medications and you're continuing to have regular seizures, then coming to an epilepsy center is something that would typically be recommended. If your doctors aren't sure of your diagnosis, we're operating under the assumption you have epilepsy, but we just don't know, uh, then it might be worth considering coming to an epilepsy center. And if you have something that's called drug-resistant epilepsy, then again, it should be recommended. And this is what I was referring to earlier, when I said that if you failed a couple of medications. So just to talk a little bit more about this definition of drug-resistant epilepsy. Uh, it used to be that patients with epilepsy were tried on one medication after another, and if they failed that medicine, it didn't work for them, or they couldn't tolerate the side effects, 
then we would just move on to the next one. And this would go on sometimes seemingly endlessly. Uh, but we've learned that patients who don't respond after the first couple of trials of medications are unlikely going to respond in full, meaning become seizure free, um, with the addition of trials of you know, a third medication, a fourth medication. So we typically recommend being considered for other treatment options at that point. As you can see, it's a very high number of folks in the United States who suffer from drug-resistant epilepsy, usually quoted at somewhere around 25 to 20% of all patients who have epilepsy. So uh, we never give up on working with the medications, but in many cases, the medications alone are going to be inadequate and we need to think about other potential solutions. And uh, as stated here, the chance that that third medicine is going to be the magic bullet is around you know, 5% or less. These are not great odds. And it's not 0%, so we don't give up on the medications. We'll always see if there might be a better medication or medication combination for you. But the chance that you're gonna become seizure-free with medications alone, once you've failed two medications at the highest dose you could tolerate, is quite low, all right? And, and so instead of spinning our wheels and just trying the next medicine, the next medicine, we start to look elsewhere, all right? Just a couple more things I'd like to mention about drug-resistant epilepsy, um, because I think a lot of folks may not be aware of the fact that these other options for treatment are out there at epilepsy centers. And it, you know, it's been well studied that these treatments, including surgery, have been underutilized for quite some time. So there was a very good study out of Canada a couple of years back that looked at the Canadian registries, uh, the national registries for the Canadian healthcare system, and to see which percentage of patients who were designated as having drug-resistant epilepsy actually received an epilepsy surgery. And the number was shockingly low at uh, 2%. And, you know, well, what's the risk of not getting that surgery? Because when we choose to just continue with the medicines and not do anything additional, we're making a choice. And that choice has a risk associated with it. And the risk they found in the Canadian population was a risk of death and mortality uh, over a two-year span was 12%, significantly higher than in the general population, a population of patients of comparable age who don't have epilepsy. So, you know, we really want to be more aggressive about getting people to epilepsy centers who could really benefit from treatments that we offer. I think another thing to mention is that patients who have different backgrounds, Asian, African-American, and patients who are not English speaking have also been found to be less likely to pursue surgery and get a full workup at an epilepsy center. So there's a lot of people out there who are missing out on care that they could benefit from. So let's get started. And I'd like to walk you through what to expect if you came to an epilepsy center, what kind of things we might discuss and talk about, uh, and what kind of things you might want to bring with you. So it's all gonna start with a clinical appointment with an epilepsy physician like myself, um, where we're gonna go through a full medical history. I strongly recommend whenever possible to bring somebody with you. Um, when an epilepsy patient comes in alone, often we are not gonna get a lot of information about the nature of the seizures because as many of you know, most patients who have epilepsy will suffer amnesia or memory loss after the seizure and can't really describe what's happening to them. So having some type of third party who knows you well, who's witnessed many of your seizures, can be a big help. And of course, these days we're all carrying these uh, cell phone cameras around, and a lot of my patients these days will bring cell phone video in on the first visit to the clinic appointment, and you know, of course a picture is worth a thousand words, so being able to see what the seizure or the spell looks like can be really valuable. You know, of course, I always emphasize it's important to make sure the patient is safe having a seizure first before you start filming. Maybe that goes without saying, but once the patient is safe and stable, um, getting that cell phone video can really be valuable to the patient's medical team. Uh, if you have any records from your prior neurologist, uh, please bring those with you. And if you have any records from any prior neurological testing you've had done, uh, specifically EEG tests, uh, electroencephalogram,
or MRI tests that you've had done in the past. So there's a lot of things we could talk about at the Epilepsy Center. And as we discussed, some patients may just need to be tried in a different medicine. Um, for some folks, we might talk about a diet strategy or lifestyle changes. But a lot of folks who aren't responding to medications should be considered to be seen if they're a candidate for a surgery. And we call this a pre-surgical evaluation. And when do we know that we should initiate a pre-surgical evaluation? Well, as we discussed, if you have drug-resistant epilepsy, the chance of seizure freedom is low. So in many cases, if I hear that story, I'm going to recommend that somebody start a pre-surgical workup. Um, and then sometimes, you know, we don't really know what treatments we can offer you until we've done this additional testing, all right? Uh, I have patients come into my office uh, in a lot of, you know, with a lot of different thoughts about what they want and what they can get. You know, some patients will come in on day one and say, I, you know, I want a brain surgery tomorrow. And they say, well, slow down, we gotta talk about this. We need to go through uh, some pretty extensive testing to figure out if that's appropriate for you. And some patients, the whole idea of brain surgery, rightfully, is terrifying. And they really could not imagine ever having a brain surgery. And what I typically tell my patients is, look, if I was in your shoes and my quality of life was poor because I'm having seizures all the time, you know, monthly, weekly, in some cases daily, um, I would want to know what all of my treatment options are. And often we can't tell you what all your treatments are treatment options are until we've completed more testing. And so I strongly recommend, even if someone's on the fence about whether they even consider a surgery, that you complete the testing first. We'll learn more about the nature of your epilepsy, and then we can tell you, here are your options. And you can then make an informed decision about how you'd like to proceed. But until we've completed the testing, and until we know what your options are, you won't be able to make that informed decision. So I really recommend going through the testing if your epilepsy physician recommends it. And I should also mention that in the hands of trained neurosurgeons, our surgical outcomes and the surgical outcomes across the country are quite good. We'll talk in a little bit more detail about what kind of numbers we're talking about, uh, but our patients do well. And, uh, and so I know making that leap of faith and from going from testing to actually having a surgery um, can be scary, but Nothing makes us feel better than to see someone who is having horrible seizures all the time become seizure free. And that is a you know, very possible outcome for many of our patients who have epilepsy surgery. Actually, I already have the numbers here. So um, a lot of people who have uh, epilepsy that is drug resistant have temporal lobe epilepsy. The temporal lobe is a part of the brain sort of behind the ear on both sides. And it's the most common site where seizures come from in the adult population. So for patients who are the best candidates for a temporal lobe surgery, they have around a 70% chance of being totally seizure free um, five to 10 years down the line. Of course, in many cases, they still have to remain on some medication, but if they're doing very well, often they can be on less medication, and in some cases, even be weaned off medication completely. But that varies from patient to patient. For sites other than the temporal lobe, like the frontal lobe or other parts of the brain, a um, little bit lower chance of being totally seizure free, but still around 50%. So if you think about those numbers we looked at earlier, what's the chance you're gonna be seizure free by trying that third medication, that fourth medication? We're talking about around a 5% or less chance. When we look at epilepsy surgery in the right candidates, we're looking at a 50 to a 70% chance of being seizure free. So this is really where the money's at in terms of getting better, all right? not from just trying another pill and then another pill. And of course, if we did all the pre-surgical testing and it turns out you weren't a candidate for an epilepsy surgery, there could be other options we could offer, including neurostimulator implants, uh, as I referred to earlier. Okay, so what are the main goals of a pre-surgical evaluation? Well, one, of course, we wanna verify that the patient has epilepsy, we wanna make sure we have the correct diagnosis. Um, about a third to a quarter of patients we see here at the epilepsy center have some other type of spell. And the reason they're not responding to their medications is because they don't have epilepsy. Um, and so we have to figure that out. Um, but for those folks who do have epilepsy, uh, 
we need to figure out what type of seizures they have. And I always tell my patients, if I could categorize epilepsy into two basic categories, you really have people who have focal seizures and you have patients who have generalized seizures. If you're not familiar with those terms, a focal seizure is a seizure that starts from one place in the brain or one focus in the brain. And the seizure will often spread from that location. I usually talk to my patients who have focal epilepsy and describe the epilepsy as a wildfire that starts in a forest and then it sort of spreads from that area. On the other hand, you have folks who have generalized epilepsy, and that's a type of epilepsy where the entire brain is generating the seizure at the very onset. In most cases, that's a genetic condition that presents earlier in life, although there are some exceptions to that. But making the distinction between focal seizures and generalized seizures is really important because depending on what type of category your seizures are in, that can dictate which medications are the best medications for you to try, or if you could potentially be a candidate for a surgery or not. Um, I don't wanna go into too much detail here, but let me at least say that if you have focal seizures and your seizures are coming from just one location within the brain, those are the types of patients who can be candidates for surgery because 99% of the brain is intact and working normally. And the other 1% is causing all the problems. It, the, it only takes a few hundred of these nerve cells in your brain called neurons to generate a seizure. And sometimes it's, it's microscopic. Uh, but if, if a trained surgeon can remove that tissue, those patients can be seizure free. On the other hand, for patients who have generalized epilepsy, because their entire brain is generating the seizure, they would not be a candidate for a surgery. We obviously can't remove the entire brain. And uh, you know, we have to think about other treatment options in, in patients who have generalized epilepsy. So making that distinction is very important during your pre-surgical evaluation. And so if we determine that seizures are focal, they're coming from one place, well, where are they coming from? Is it really just one location where the seizures start? Are the seizures coming from both sides? It's bilateral. Or is it coming from many different sites in what we call multifocal seizures? That'll be really critical in terms of figuring out if surgery is an option. And of course, we're also gonna do an important evaluation of cognitive function, which could include memory, attention, language. And we also wanna do some mapping of the brain to figure out where in the brain are those normal functions. So part of the workup is to figure out where the problems are occurring, where the epilepsy starts from in the brain. But the other piece is to figure out where is the primary motor area? Where are these language regions that are so essential and that we would know exactly where they are so we could show that to a surgeon and they would know that they can't touch those areas. And of course, general evaluation for physical and mental health is always important. Um, you know, the process of going through an epilepsy surgery is not easy. Um, and I should mention now that the time frame to get this testing done is usually several months. Um, you know, I kind of explain to my patients that if someone's going to get an epilepsy surgery, it, it's a little bit like a space shuttle launch. So a lot of things that need to come into place. We need to do our due diligence and be 100% certain we know exactly what's causing your spells and if they're seizures, exactly where they're coming from. So, so we do a lot of testing to make sure that we feel very, very confident about our conclusions. So um, the journey begins. You know, this is... Uh, my attempt to kind of walk you through what would be involved in a pre-surgical evaluation at a level four epilepsy center, some of the tests you might hear about or maybe you've heard about previously, and hopefully demystify a little bit what we do at an epilepsy center and what the patient's experience would be, and also how your epilepsy doctor would be involved each step of the way. So for everybody that gets a pre-surgical evaluation, almost without exception, there's a few essential tests that everyone's going to go through. And so I'll emphasize those uh, in the most detail. But the first test is called video EEG, or video electroencephalography. And that's done at a special epilepsy monitoring unit uh, where you would actually come in, stay at the hospital, and have your seizures recorded. So we'll talk about that in detail. Of course, we're gonna need brain imaging uh, with a brain MRI, a high quality brain MRI. And also the neuropsychological testing 
I referred to earlier is also critical in terms of to determine for the patient what's their current level of cognitive function, what does that tell us about where the seizures might be coming from, and how might that person respond to a surgery. Now, there's a lot of other tests that may be required. Every person's journey is different in terms of how much testing they're going to require to really get a firm answer in terms of where the seizures are coming from. So let me just go through a few of these names. Uh, again, I won't go into too much detail now, but I'm going to circle back and talk about these tests individually uh, later during my talk. So um, a brain PET scan is one option. Uh, another is something called a MEG scan or magnetoencephalography scan. There's the ictal spec scan. I know these all sound like jargon, but I, I will tell you what, what this all means shortly. There's also functional MRI language testing. Uh, some additional language testing called the WADA test. Uh, the WADA is actually the name of a doctor in Japan who developed this testing many years back. Sometimes patients will require something called invasive EEG. Not every patient needs that, but you might hear that term thrown around sometimes, so I think it's important for me to describe a little bit about what's involved. There's actual brain mapping we can do for motor and language functioning at the bedside for patients who have invasive EEG. And some patients actually have brain mapping done in the operating room. So let's talk about the principal testing that everybody's going to need who goes through a surgical evaluation. And the critical first test in most cases is coming into the epilepsy monitoring unit. It's also referred to as phase one testing. Um, so what's involved? So basically the patient's going to come into a specialized unit to record their seizures. And I know this sounds a lot, you know, rather odd to a lot of my patients in terms of you know, you're asking me to come into a hospital to actually have seizures. You know, I'm trying to avoid having seizures. And what I usually say to my patients is, you're already having seizures now, and we're not getting important data and information from those seizures to help you. If you come into the epilepsy monitoring unit, we can actually record those seizures in a controlled environment, and then use the information to then get you better control over your epilepsy, all right? So we know it's not easy, but it's, it's, a, it's a very worthwhile week, and we almost always learn something very valuable about your epilepsy. So it's usually a week of continuous recording. Uh, many of you who are joining us tonight probably have had an EEG in the past. And most routine EEG studies at a neurology clinic are going to be about 45 minutes to an hour long. But this is a continuous recording. It's going on for days and days on end. And the hope is to actually record your brainwave activity during a typical seizure. There's trained nursing staff who will be watching you the entire time. 24 hours a day, um, and typically, because we only have you know, five to seven days to record seizures, we're going to lower your medication. Uh, in some cases, discontinue the medication completely to set the stage for a seizure to happen. But like I mentioned, it's the safest possible place uh, to have a seizure. Um, there'll be padded bed rails, a nurse outside. Um, there's continuous video monitoring so that someone's watching you the entire time. There's also an invent button you can press. So if you have a type of epilepsy where you feel an aura or some type of warning, you can hit that button to an alert a nurse. We're gonna come in, uh, make sure everything's stable, um, and then also check your vitals after the seizure is over. Usually give high flow oxygen and sometimes some suction. Sometimes we will do sleep deprivation as well or use strobe lights to stimulate a seizure. Um, and generally, having one seizure recorded is not enough. I mentioned before, some patients have seizures coming from multiple locations throughout the brain. And so it's important that we record all the seizure types that you're experiencing out in the normal world when you come into the epilepsy monitoring unit. And we would like to get an example of all of those just to make sure that the seizures are, you know, uh, coming not from just one location, but possibly multiple locations, because we would need to know that before we can make recommendations about potential treatment. Um, and at most centers, you can have a family member stay with you. And I certainly have many patients who um, are not verbal or developmentally delayed or just need to be reassured and have somebody they know who's there. It's not required to have a family member stay with you, but it can often be quite helpful because in many cases, your family or friends will know you and your seizures best. And so 
if there's subtle onset of a new seizure, they often will hit the button first and then the nurse will come in and check on you. So what kind of information do we get from an epilepsy monitoring unit study? Well, we're gonna get uh, these squiggly lines, which is an EET, but we can use those squiggly lines to help us determine a few things. Um, again, we're confirming that the seizures are indeed epileptic, which is critical. Um, we're gonna, as I mentioned before, determine if the seizures are coming from just one focus and if it's a focal seizure or if you have generalized epilepsy. And uh, again, we can use this data to localize where in the brain the seizures actually come from. Uh, just a little bit more about focal seizures versus generalized seizures. So of patients who have drug-resistant epilepsy, two-thirds of those are going to have focal seizures, meaning again, coming from one place, often the temporal lobe, but sometimes other locations. On the other hand, generalized seizures are in about a third of patients who have drug-resistant epilepsy. And again, that distinction is that if there's just one focus where the brain come, or where the seizures come from, then an epilepsy surgery or other invasive treatment could be considered. If you have generalized epilepsy, then a surgical resection would not be an option, but there may be other types of options we could consider. So this is a, a really important branch point when we're determining what type of epilepsy you have and figuring out what treatments are on the table. I wanna talk a bit about brain imaging. I won't go into too much detail, but I at least want you to have a little bit more familiarity after this talk with uh, some of the names of these tests and, and sort of what's involved from your uh, standpoint in terms of the experience of having these tests done. Uh, many of you who are joining us tonight have already had brain MRI, so you're familiar with this loud machine where you go into a tube and, and have pictures taken of your brain. We generally recommend that you have a highest quality MRI scan done possible. Um, for most folks, we try to get what's called a three Tesla brain MRI. Tesla is just a measurement of the strength of the magnetic field. But at this you know, slightly higher strength, we can often see more detail and can see abnormalities we can't see on a standard 1.5 Tesla MRI. So this is usually the standard brain scan that we use to start the pre-surgical evaluation. Now, a lot of folks who have epilepsy are going to have totally normal appearing brain MRIs. And in patients where that's the case, that's about a third of patients, uh, we're going to need to look into other potential brain imaging modalities. Another type of brain scan that can be helpful is something called a brain PET scan. And PET stands for positron emission tomography. This scan doesn't look at the structure of the brain tissue, but instead looks at the distribution of blood flow. I have a little example here, if you can you know, see on the screen. Um, the red and orange areas are what we call hot spots, where there's a lot of blood flow, and the blue and green areas are uh, areas where it's cooler or where there's less blood flow. And typically for patients who have focal seizures, the area of the brain where the seizures occur tend to have diminished blood flow in between the seizures. So we usually see it at a colder site. This particular scan, one of the temporal lobes is a little bit greener and darker than the other one. Uh, and, and that suggested that seizures possibly coming from that location. It looks like I, I can't use my pointer here. So a little bit darker here on this PET scan. This scan does involve having uh, an IV placed and you'll be given an IV injection of some radioactively labeled water. Uh, it's not dangerous levels of radioactivity by any means, um, but once that uh, radioactive label water enters the bloodstream, a scanner called a cyclotron takes these pictures which looks at blood flow patterns. Uh, another scan we don't use as often but can be helpful in patients where we're having difficulty finding where the seizures come from is called a MEG scan or magnetoencephalography. Uh, this scan again is non-invasive and it's sort of uh, the flip side of the EEG test we do. So, the EEG, or the electroencephalogram, looks at the electrical field around the head. But every object that has an electrical field also has a magnetic field, and that's what the MEG scan is looking at. The advantage of this scan is it often can find abnormal changes in the magnetic field in deeper areas of the brain, whereas the EEG typically is just looking at the surface or outside portion of the brain. The MEG scan can look in, in deep centers and see if there's 
uh, abnormalities we can't see uh, on other forms of brain imaging or EEG. The ictal spec scan, again, it's a mouthful, uh, but it's similar to the PET scan. Uh, spec is single positron emission computerized tomography, if you're interested. But the basic idea of this scan is to look at blood flow patterns, but this time blood flow patterns essentially right after a seizure occurs. Now, this testing is a little bit more involved. The patient typically needs to be admitted to an epilepsy monitoring unit where they're having continuous EEG monitoring. And then when they have a verified seizure, a technician will push radio labeled tracer uh, into IV again, and this time look for the hot spot, not the cold spot. So blood flow actually increases to the area of the brain that's generating a seizure. Even though it's a cold area where we don't see a lot of blood flow in between the seizures, we do see a hot spot immediately after the seizure. And this can be a good test in patients who are having a lot of frequent seizures that we can you know, uh, get a scan within a day or two uh, to see where the seizures appear to be coming from. Okay, so the brain scans I was talking about before were really focused on figuring out where the seizures come from. As I mentioned earlier, part of the surgical evaluation is also to figure out where normal function in the brain is localized to. Uh, the standard way that most epilepsy centers are doing this now is with non-invasive MRI imaging called functional MRI. And this is a little bit different than your typical MRI. You know, if you've been in the MRI scanner before, you probably had earplugs in because of the noise and closed your eyes and tried to go to sleep. In the functional MRI, you're actually be performing a language task while you're in the scanner. So a computer screen is projected to a little mirror in front of your eyes, and generally you will go through language tasks like rhyming tasks or generating a verb, um, and you just do this all internally. You don't actually have to speak in the scanner. And by looking at blood flow patterns during this time, we can accurately localize where in the brain your language function is located. For most right-handed people, language is gonna be located on the left side. Um, and for lefties, it's still probably gonna be on the left side as well, but there's a better chance there could be language on both sides uh, or on the right side. So again, if we're gonna consider a surgery, we have to know where the language function is located. Now this non-invasive test, test is great, um, but sometimes the results can be ambiguous or unclear. So for folks who are not quite sure, we move on to a test, which this is our first invasive test that I'm mentioning, which is called the WADA test. And I should mention at this point, um, and it probably is intuitive, but we almost always start with as much non-invasive testing at the beginning to see if that's going to be sufficient. And if we can't figure it out with non-invasive testing, then we reserve our invasive tests later down the road. Now the WADA test is something that's done by an interventional uh, neuroradiologist. And it's a very interesting procedure. So they do a test called a cerebral angiogram. It's performed while you're awake, just local anesthesia. And they place a catheter into the leg area, into the large arteries, and then move that catheter up into one of the carotid arteries. These are the major arteries going to the brain where you can feel your pulse on the side of your neck. And what they'll do then is uh, inject a special medication that's an anesthetic, either Brevitol or Amitol, into one carotid artery at a time. And by doing this, they can effectively anesthetize or put to sleep one half of your brain for a few minutes, okay? Uh, my patients always describe this as a very strange experience, but nothing that's frightening. And when their brain is anesthetized on one half, then usually a neuropsychologist or a neurologist will do some testing at that point, language testing, and also memory testing. The effect of the anesthetic usually wears off after a few minutes and you're fully back to normal. But essentially what this test does is it previews how would you be functioning if half of your brain was shut off or if half of your brain was removed uh, hypothetically in some form of surgery. Can you still speak normally? Is your memory still intact? So often this testing can provide additional reassurance that someone would tolerate a surgery well and have a good outcome. You know, I also want to mention, you know, as an aside, but when we're thinking about who's a candidate for surgery, you know, we have to, you know, first do no harm. That's the creed of all physicians. We have to make sure that, A, we would not be hurting the patient in the process. You know, no epilepsy physician 
would ever recommend that somebody lose language function or lose motor function as a trade-off to stop their seizures. And then the second part is to make sure that we felt that a surgery would actually be effective and do what we set out to do, which is to get rid of your seizures. And as I mentioned, the WADA test will help figure out which side of the brain has speech centers. And if the left side or the right side is sufficient on its own for verbal and uh, specifically verbal memory. So now we're gonna talk about neuropsychological testing. This is one of the essential tests for anyone undergoing a surgical evaluation. And it's basically like a really fancy SAT test, okay? So it's gonna be a battery of cognitive tests for attention, memory, language, spatial functioning, something called working memory. And it takes some time, so it's a better part of a day, usually about seven to eight hours. It can be done in one sitting, or sometimes it can be split up into two separate sessions. Um, just mentioned here, patients can be asked to you know, solve puzzles, answer specific questions, and then there'll be scoring. And, and, and the, the results, the way we use these is one, sometimes patients have specific difficulties in cognitive function that can help us further localize their seizures to a specific area of the brain. So typically, areas of the brain where seizures come from have less blood flow, and they also don't function quite as well. The second piece is that we need to know what your cognitive level of functioning is at this time. So that if we did offer you a surgery in the future, we could tell you how you would respond to that surgery and what your level of functioning would be like after that surgery. You know, if this testing suggested that somebody would suffer significant cognitive loss from the surgery, and then we would not decide to move forward with surgical planning. So, you've done all these tests over a couple of months, and now the job of your epilepsy physician and epilepsy center team is to bring all of that information together, all right? And uh, as I mentioned, it can take several months to complete the testing, and this testing will then be presented in front of a group at a multidisciplinary epilepsy surgery conference. Uh, at our conference, we have all of our epilepsy surgeons present, all of our epilepsy neurologists, neuroradiologists, neuropsychologist or nurse practitioner, and we make a group consensus decision about who's a candidate for surgery and who's not, and in some cases, who needs additional testing to answer that question. So based on the results of all of your testing uh, and the discussion that takes place at an epilepsy surgery conference, the team may recommend proceeding to an epilepsy surgery, okay? And then you can make a decision. You know, this is the recommendation from your epilepsy team, is this something you want to move forward with? In many cases, epilepsy surgery is the patient's best option to become seizure free. Uh, I won't go into too much detail today about the actual surgeries themselves, but suffice it to say, there are traditional surgeries where brain tissue is removed uh, with the scalpel. And then in some cases, patients can be can uh, candidates for less invasive surgeries, uh, what's called laser ablation. Not every patient's a candidate for this, but if you've ever considered epilepsy surgery and thought to yourself, you know, I just can't imagine having a large hole in the skull and having a surgeon go in and remove brain tissue. Well, there are other options out there and some patients can have less invasive laser surgeries that are appropriate. Um, some patients will not be a candidate for an epilepsy surgery. For example, if we find that your seizures are actually coming from both sides of the brain, well, we cannot safely remove tissue from both sides of the brain. I kind of describe to my patients that your brain is a little bit like your kidneys. You need one side fully functioning, okay, in order to be a healthy, fully functioning adult. Um, so if the seizures are coming from both sides or coming from multiple locations, then perhaps an epileptic surgery isn't appropriate. But if we've already found where the seizures are coming from, you could be a candidate for an implantable stimulator, such as a neuropace device. Uh, which is implanted directly into the brain. Now, some patients who are presented at epilepsy conference, we have a general sense of where their seizures are coming from, but we don't know the exact location. Um, I was watching Dr. Rao's uh, prior presentation uh, from a couple months ago, and I found that he uses the same analogy that I like to use, which is sometimes with the initial surgical evaluation, we can figure out the neighborhood that the seizures live in, but that's not good enough. We need the street address. 
We need to know exactly where the seizures come from before we can consider surgery as an option and if it's safe. So there's an additional recording we can do called invasive EEG. I just wanted to touch on a little bit today. So invasive EEG involves coming back to the epilepsy monitoring unit. And some people refer to this as phase two recording. Remember phase one recording was the scalp recording uh, with the video EEG, standard uh, video EEG testing that all patients get who go through uh, surgical evaluation. But the scalp EEG is by no means perfect, okay? It's really limited to recording seizures coming from the outside portion of the brain. And of course, we're trying to record seizures through skull, muscle, and skin. And so there can be a lot of what we call artifact or noise we can't see through. With invasive EEG, we can have our surgical colleagues place electrodes into exact uh, places in the brain with extreme precision. Uh, here are some examples of, of different electrode placement. These are called depth electrodes here, where electrodes are actually placed within the brain tissue into some deep centers that are often difficult to see on just scalp video EEG recording. And these are called strip electrodes here, where electrodes are placed on the surface of the brain. Sometimes there are large grid arrays of, of electrodes placed on the brain to specifically map out where the seizures are coming from. Now, not only do these electrodes placed on the brain surface uh, help us record, but we can actually plug a stimulator device, this is a little example of it here, into the electrodes to actually send electrical current through those areas. Why would we want to do that? Well, by sending current through those areas, we can actually stimulate those centers. And this is a great way to determine if the areas under the electrodes are responsible for motor movement or for language function. Um, so with the patient completely awake in the epilepsy monitoring unit, their neurologist will be sitting next to them with this stimulator device. It's a little bit of a surreal experience, uh, but it's very well tolerated. And if we stimulate an area that is a motor region, you may feel your finger twitch. You may feel your face twitch. You may feel your hand jump. You would then label that site as a motor area and it would be identified and that would be expressed to the surgeon. This is an area we can't touch. It could disrupt this patient's motor or movement function. We can also test language in this manner. Uh, this is a picture of the placement of electrode grids on a patient's brain and it's color coded uh, based on where they had found language centers, where they had found motor centers. So this is a form of brain mapping, where ultimately we're trying to develop a map of showing where the seizures come from and also where normal function is located. And then we then use that map to develop a surgical plan. So like I mentioned at the very beginning, we're going from non-invasive uh, testing to much more invasive testing. Um, now, the most invasive testing we do is actual intraoperative brain mapping. And again, it's a very interesting experience um, for the patient, but this is actually where someone is awoken during a brain operation. So the anesthesiologist can adjust the anesthesia in such a way that a patient can be completely comfortable and awake during a brain surgery, believe it or not. Uh, local anesthesia is used, and while the patient's awake, uh, in a similar fashion to the bedside brain mapping, we can do stimulation on the surface of the brain, or the neurosurgeon would do that, and see if it results in motor movements, disruption in speech, and that's another way that we can map critical normal function in the brain. Of course, the patient is put back asleep after this testing under full general anesthesia, and, it, and then the full operation will be performed um, if we can move forward at that point. So I hope I didn't go into too much detail to uh, confuse anybody, but I want people to have at least some familiarity with some of these terms uh, that you might hear when you go to an epilepsy center about testing that could be recommended for you, okay? The bottom line is we're trying to develop a roadmap for epilepsy treatment and for potential epilepsy surgery. And a lot is involved. And so it's really about, on that first day, establishing a partnership with your epilepsy physician or epileptologist. We're going to be on the journey with you every single step of the way. And as we get results from your tests, we can talk about what, what are the meaning of these tests and what kind of options in terms of treatment might that 
open doors for, all right? Um, I just wanted to close today um, by saying that, you know, my favorite part of my job is going through this journey with my patients. You know, I see many patients on the first day that they come to an epilepsy center who, uh, for better or worse, um, have learned to live with their epilepsy. They become accustomed to having a seizure every couple months. They become accustomed to not being able to drive, maybe pursue some of their life goals. I think it's really important when I see somebody on the first day to reorient them and let them know that there's probably more treatment out there than they've really been aware of before. And that the goal from day one should be total seizure freedom. Now we can't always accomplish that in every patient, uh, but in many cases we can at least minimize seizures as much as possible. The truth is we don't know what we can accomplish until we've done the testing, until we've gone on the journey to figure out what's going on. And my favorite part of my job is when I see patients who successfully had epilepsy surgery or a stimulator implant, and a year later, we're talking to them about maybe lowering their medications because they're seizure-free. We're talking to them about filling out DMV paperwork to see if they can drive. Uh, we're talking about filling out paperwork for an employer to let the employer know that they're safe uh, to start their new job. And um, you know, so I strongly encourage you, if you're listening to this lecture and you think you've could be a candidate uh, for a surgery based on what we talk about. If you think that you know, there's unanswered questions or that you know, potentially um, there's other treatments might be available to you because the medications have failed time and time again, I strongly encourage you to ask your the primary neurologist to refer you to a level four epilepsy center. And we'd love to see you and discuss what other options might be available. So with that, I just wanted to put out references for a couple of the studies I uh, discussed here and say thank you for uh, taking the time to listen and I wanted to open things up to any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Ambrose. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions to the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen or if you're watching on Facebook through the comment section. The first question is, why is, or is it difficult for a Kaiser patient to get elevated to a level four facility? Um, sorry, and the, so the question was, is it difficult for what type of patient to come to an, a level four center? A Kaiser patient. Oh, um, I guess the short answer is it shouldn't be, <laughs> okay. Um, now it is true. I mean, not every physician, in, at least in our system, is aware that the epilepsy center is here. Um, but I've worked hard to make sure all of our primary neurologists know that we're here and it should be seamless. Um, you don't, if you're a Kaiser patient, you don't have to get referred out of system. You can get referred to one of our two epilepsy centers. Uh, one is my center in Redwood City and the other one is in Sacramento, uh, where my colleagues uh, work. So I think it's really just a matter of asking your neurologist if uh, they think that, you know, you're appropriate uh, to come see us at the epilepsy center. And in most all cases, it won't be an issue. Um, and of course, you can always ask them to reach out directly to me if, if you'd like me to review your case and we can determine if you should be seen at the epilepsy center. Thank you. The next question is, how do surgical options for TLE affect memory or cognitive problems? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. So, um, so TLE uh, is referring to temporal lobe epilepsy, which as I mentioned is the most common form of focal epilepsy in adult patients. And the temporal lobe is a very important structure. Um, it houses some other important regions of the brain, uh, namely the hippocampus, which is the primary short-term memory center. So that's why testing of memory is really crucial prior to an operation. Um, we can generally figure out if someone's going to tolerate an epilepsy surgery uh, that would remove the temporal lobe and the hippocampus by looking at their neuropsychological testing results. Sometimes doing memory testing through WADA testing might be required to really know how somebody would do if the temporal lobe and hippocampus on one side is removed. Um, you know, this comes up a lot where you know, there can be potential for some memory changes after a temporal lobe uh, surgery. And, but this is how I describe it to my patients. So first off, 
many patients' memory is actually going to be improved after an epilepsy surgery. And if you think about it, if the hippocampus and the temporal lobe is having this abnormal electrical activity going on all the time, it's disrupting normal memory function. And this is why so many patients who have temporal lobe seizures suffer from short-term memory loss. Um, some patients are not gonna have their memory changed at all, but there will be a small percentage of patients who notice a small step down in their short-term memory. Um, of course, we will have evaluated your short-term memory before we considered you for surgery to determine if that small step down would be tolerable. So I do have some patients that after a temporal lobe surgery need to be a little bit more mindful about putting alarms on their phone, keeping a strict calendar um, to jog their memory. Often about a year after the surgery, they'll notice their memory picks up as the opposite remaining temporal lobe picks up some of the function uh, that was lost on the side that was removed for surgery. Uh, it's a, a concept we call brain plasticity, um, and that can help people compensate for this. Um, but even for my patients who noticed some worsening of short-term memory, they feel that the trade-off for being seizure-free is well worth it. The last thing I just want to mention here is that, um, you know, for patients who are concerned about memory loss, memory changes following a temporal lobe uh, uh, surgery, if, if you're continuing to have seizures on a regular basis, the repetitive effect of having those seizures will cause worsening memory loss, sort of, you know, quote unquote, organically or naturally, all right, um, where the hippocampus can become scarred from having so many seizures. So if we don't do something about your epilepsy, many patients will suffer significant memory loss just from the process of the epilepsy. So in those cases, generally removing the disease and damaged temporal lobe and hippocampus in the long term is going to result in more memory preservation. Thank you. We have uh, two quick questions about local epilepsy centers. So. The first one is, is the Sacramento Kaiser a level four epilepsy center? So Kaiser four, uh, sorry, Kaiser Sacramento at this point, I believe is a level three center, meaning that they have an epilepsy monitoring unit and they have trained epileptologists, nurse practitioner, neuropsychologists. Kaiser Sacramento at present does not have trained epilepsy neurosurgeons. So right now, all the cases that are worked up at uh, Kaiser Sacramento come to Kaiser Redwood City for their surgery. However, even though that team is in Sacramento and we're here in Redwood City, we all work together. We share many patients. Uh, Kaiser Sacramento presents their patients at our epilepsy surgery conference, and then the surgeries can be done here at Redwood City. So we really work as an extended group, um, but they do not have the level four designation so Kaiser Sacramento epilepsy patients, if they need surgery, they will be performed at Redwood City. Thank you. Um, and then another question is, um, if someone is being seen at Kaiser Oakland, how can they get a referral to the epilepsy center? Yeah, and so you know, we know the Oakland team very well. Um, so it would just be a matter of emailing or calling your primary neurologist at Oakland and saying, look, I, I saw a a lecture or a talk by Dr. Ambrose at Redwood City. Um, based on what he discussed, I'm wondering if I might, you know, need a referral or benefit from a referral to an epilepsy center. And if they agree, and usually they're more than happy to have you see us here, um, they would put a consult in and then we could see you. Thank you. Uh, the next question um, is about if someone has taking four medications and has not had a seizure for almost four years, what is the possibility that the seizures will return? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I guess, so most patients who are seizure-free on medications alone generally require one or two medicines, but certainly there are patients who need a third or sometimes a fourth medication. I guess the fact that you required four medications suggests that the epilepsy is probably um, relatively aggressive, but at the same time, the fact you've achieved seizure freedom for four years is a really good sign. Um, you know, I, I don't know all the details of your background of epilepsy, um, but for my patients, if they can go several years without a seizure, then I think that we can discuss, you know, 
perhaps simplifying their medications. Maybe they could go from four medicines to three, and then we would watch for another year or two and see if they can go from three to two. Um, it's highly variable in terms of you know, whether someone could become totally medication free, especially if they've required four medications to get under good control. But I would first start by talking to your neurologist about could you be considered to be on less medicine? Um, of course, the caveat to this is we, you know, we live in California. Everybody needs to drive for their work life, for their social life. And when we lower medications, we don't know if seizures are going to return or not. So it often requires taking a break from driving for a couple months. And for some patients, um, that can be a big burden. So we usually have to have that conversation with your neurologist and see if it's worth considering uh, you know, a trial on less medication. Thank you. The next question is, if you had a brain tumor removed and have epilepsy as a result, are you still a candidate for more surgery? You could be. Um, a lot of it depends on the location of where uh, the tumor was and where it was removed. Um, but, you know, we see many patients who have had other abnormalities, what we call lesions in the brain, whether it's a, a brain tumor, an abnormal blood vessel like a cavernoma or uh, arteriovenous malformation that people have had surgery for. And in many cases, they were seizure-free for a period of time and then seizures returned. Um, so those patients can still be candidates for a revision of their original surgery, uh, specifically focused on stopping epilepsy, um, or they could be a candidate for an implantable uh, neurostimulator device like Neuropace or Vagal Nerve Stimulator. So having had a prior surgery for almost any indication, including brain tumor, would not rule you out for additional surgery. Um, of course, that would have to be evaluated, and a lot of it depends on location and where the seizures are coming up from uh, now, but I've had many patients who had brain tumors and then needed additional surgical intervention to become seizure-free. Thank you. The last question I'm seeing for now is, Omphi is a new drug I was recently recommended, but I am a little hesitant due to it being a more powerful drug. Do you have any experience with Omphi or have you prescribed it to any of your patients? Uh, yeah. Um, so Onfi is also called Clobazam, and uh, it's a newer medication. It's still a brand name medication, um, but it's really a cousin medication of a lot of other drugs that you've probably heard of that are out there. Um, it's in a class of meds called benzodiazepines. that includes things like Ativan, Clonopin, other drugs you might have heard of. Um, I think that Onfi has been effective for uh, many patients I've had. And there's some patients I've had who either can't tolerate it or, um, or it's just not as effective as we like it to be. So, you know, it really there's, you know, 24, 25 medications out there and um, each medication, you know, it's hard to predict in advance who's going to have a really great response and become seizure free on it, who's going to have significant side effects. So we generally try to base our recommendations for medication on your, your neurological history, your medical history. And then we always start at the lowest possible dose and work our way up from there. So, yes, I have had a good experience with Onfi in some patients. So if your neurologist is, really thinks that's the next medication to try, um, I think it's reasonable. But you would treat it like you would any other medication. Uh, if you're doing great on it, keep going up on it as your neurologist recommends. If you're having intolerable side effects, then it's probably not going to be the one for you and you would need to let your neurologist know right away. Thank you. One more question came in, which is, can someone with nocturnal seizures be a candidate for surgery? Absolutely. Um, so nocturnal seizures refers to patients who have seizures uh, primarily or exclusively at night while they're sleeping. Um, and you know, certainly, regardless of when your seizures occur during daytime, nighttime, or what triggers them, I have a lot of patients that have primarily uh, seizures with their menstrual cycle. Um, they can all potentially be candidates for a surgery. And because when you come into an epilepsy monitoring unit, we're recording your brainwave activity and your seizures 24 hours a day, uh, we would be able to record those types of seizures just as well and hopefully figure out where in the brain they're coming from and then determine if surgery could be an option for you. Thank you. I think our, that's our last question for tonight. Do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? 
No, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, who took the time to call in. And I, I think just, you know, the bottom line, you know, there's a lot of details I talked about in my talk tonight, but I think the bottom line is that, um, you know, the initial goal should always be seizure free. If you're struggling to achieve that, and it's been some time that you've been working with your, your neurologist, and you've tried two or more medicines, and it's just not cutting it, then I would strongly recommend asking your primary neurologist for a referral to an epilepsy center. There could be many excellent options for you, and we'd love to talk to you. Thank you, Dr. Ambrose, and thank you to everyone for attending tonight's webinar. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. NeuroPACE is a sponsor of the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California's webinar series. You can find more information on new treatment options for epilepsy patients at www.neuropace.com. On behalf of NeuroPACE, Dr. Ambrose, and the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone.